this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler66, Hour of the Truth, in collaboration with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. I thought we have done already 27 broadcasts of this series of the End Time Delusion, speaking of the wonderful book that Steve Wahlberg wrote, Tom and Me Together. Why not put his picture in the beginning there, Jeff first me, and then say I invite Tom now? No, I don't invite Tom. Tom is doing that with me together. We are equal co-hosts on this program. He is connected with me via Skype, this wonderful uh, free-of-charge technology that we have for the in uh, of the Internet for the moment. As long as it lasts, Tom and I will continue in exposing the futurist lie and telling you about the end-time delusion that Steve Wahlberg wrote a book about and that actually is Tom's ministry for the last 20 years. And I'm so, so glad to welcome Tom again to the microphone this evening with me on the 28th broadcast in the 13th chapter of the book, End-Time Delusion. Hello, Tom. Welcome. Hello. It's a privilege and a blessing to get to do this to, again and, and uh, continue our reading and discussion of Steve Wahlberg's book. Let's go right into it without any delay. We stopped on page 80 of 225, so you see there is still a lot of stuff to go for. That is because we talk about many other things in between, but that is also very important because all these other points make very important um objectives uh, of the futurist agenda clear to everybody and it is not that we can really adhere to the book always but we take this book more as a, uh, a guideline let's say yeah? it's a it's a line that we want to walk on and uh, we are taking this book but that doesn't mean that we cannot go left or right and add to it in information that's info uh, important there is much information that we can put onto, and we did that last week with the reading. 
I'm going to show you right now where it is because I'm going to repeat where we uh, left off last time. We are still in the chapter that is called The Restrainer, Myths and Memories, of course. And in this little chapter, we spoke about that the early church believed the Roman Empire was the restrainer of the Antichrist. Many have recognized this fact. Eliot, which is E.B. Eliot, the author of the book Hore Apocalyptica, he wrote, quote, we have the consenting testimony of the early fathers, from Irenaeus, the disciple of St. John, down to Chrysostom and Jerome, to the effect that it, meaning the restrainer, it was understood to be the imperial power ruling and residing at Rome. Unquote. Dr. George Eldon Ladd, a much-respected Baptist professor at Fuller Theological Seminary in the 1950s, also confirmed, quote, the traditional view has been that the restraining principle is the Roman Empire and the restrainer is the Emperor. He who now letteth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. That's right. This view, or a modification of it, best fits into the Pauline theology. And the Pauline theology is just the explanation that Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, gave to his apostles to teach the first churches. Yeah. That's Pauline theology. You know, we always read about these words like Pauline theology. What is that? Well, I'm, going, I'm just going to explain it to you. That is Pauline theology. It is the words of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, using Paul, teaching the first churches, and they are teaching every Bible-believing Christian since 2,000 years. There is no Pauline theology. There's biblical truths. There's biblical historicism. That is what Tom and I are preaching to you. And you can also take a little part out of it and call it the Pauline theology. But in the end, it comes all down to, is it biblical or isn't it? And if it's biblical... Well, it's biblical exegesis. It's biblical hermeneutic. Yeah. Tom, anything to say on that? Yes, I, I, we've been saying that uh, the early church understood that the restraining power was the Roman Empire, the Caesars, and that when they were taken out of the way, when the civil power ruling the Roman Empire was taken out of the way, then in the power vacuum left behind, the man of sin would rise up. The Antichrist, the beast, the little horn that Daniel prophesied. And what we're just reading is that this was the common belief of all early Christians from, from, from those under Paul's ministry listening to Pauline theology, as it's described here, all the way till the present. Truth never changes, okay? Uh, and the truth was taught from Paul's mouth. He who now letteth, that is in the time of Paul and the Thessalonians, who were listening to him speak, face-to-face -face previously, and who were now reading his letter to them, he said, he who now letteth will let, or he who now restrains will restrain the rise of the Antichrist until the restrainer is taken out of the way. And then Daniel's little horn to be revealed the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the one that uh, Christians today don't believe has ever been revealed. This is what's so criminal about what's being taught in the churches and what has been taught in the churches since about 1805 or 1810, somewhere in there. When futurism... The belief that the 70th week of Daniel is future began to be taught in the Protestant and evangelical seminaries in England. And eventually, that false teaching, that 
counterfeit uh, rendering of Daniel's prophecy was beginning to be taught in this country. And E.B. Elliott and Henry Grattan Guinness and, and, and most of the great Protestant evangelical writers and historians were trying to fight this new thing that was being taught. They were literally saying, now, wait a minute. Christians have believed since the time of Paul that the restraining power preventing the rise of the Antichrist was the Roman Caesar. You mean to tell me that the Antichrist has never been revealed? Is that what the Protestant evangelical preachers are teaching now? How can they do this when common sense defies their futurist baloney? And so they were preaching against this new thing that had never before been conceived in the Protestant and evangelical world and that was migrating from the, the seminaries of England to the pulpits of the United States. And we were being corrupted with diabolical lies, lies that prevent us from understanding what was always understood in the body of Christ throughout the Christian era, that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. They were literally rewriting history. That's what they hated the most that this history of the papacy was undeniable. It was so visible. It was so in your face. It was so well known. And it was so often preached to the people. And the, the diabolical history of the popes and the crusades and the inquisitions and the false doctrines and the false miracles and the bleeding statues and the mass and all the other abominations of the Roman Catholic Church were taught to Christians never to be deceived by Rome again. And here they are teaching all of a sudden out of the Protestant evangelical churches, uh, the pulpits of the Protestant evangelical churches, that that restrainer hasn't been taken out of the way. And the man of sin has never been revealed. That won't happen until just before Christ returns. So the whole Christian era is completely devoid of any antichrist. Okay, we've got no antichrist to fear. So automatically, what's your new view of the papacy? Well, whether you like the looks of the Pope's garb and his funky fish head hat and all of his hocus pocus and all, at least he preaches Jesus, right? Isn't that what we believe? Isn't that what the Protestants and evangelicals believe? Yeah, he's got a few wayward priests that like to defile the little boys, but they love Jesus, don't they? And that's the ecumenical movement. It's left the door open for Protestants and evangelicals now to join this group that they now call Christian when always before, all throughout the Christian era, they claimed the papacy was the antichrist of scripture, history, and prophecy. Don't look for another antichrist. There isn't one, not one that even comes close to fulfilling all the prophecies in the Bible of the antichrist. And for certain, don't look into the history or into the distant future, assuming and proposing and denying that the, that the Antichrist ever existed in the world throughout the Christian era. You see, ever since the Council of Trent, that definitive, most authoritative Council of Trent that took place in the 1540s, right after the Protestant Reformation, which began in 1517, the Council of Trent began to wage an all-out war of annihilation against Protestants and against the Protestant teaching and belief. And what is it, once again, class? Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. So the Jesuits, the Council of Trent convened, 
It was carefully managed, and they set out and 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 issued a publicly and globally declared war of annihilation against Protestantism and the Protestant belief. And their answer to Protestantism was to infiltrate the, the seminaries of Protestant England and begin to teach futurism. A cockamamie idea that should never have been believed by any Protestant or evangelical that somehow Daniel's prophecy was not fulfilled 2,000 years ago. That the 70th week of Daniel was not fulfilled. Now, certainly by now you have to understand if you're going to teach that the 70th week of Daniel has not been fulfilled, then Jesus was not the Christ. Okay, they didn't teach that. But they taught that the 70th week of Daniel was future, not history. You know, the truth is called historicism. All Bible believing Christians throughout history were historicist in their understanding and interpretation of Daniel's prophecy. History confirmed that their understanding was correct, unimpeachable, unquestionable. You cannot rebut the truth. Historical evidence leaves no possibility that the 70th week of Daniel is future. It was fulfilled in the last seven years before the gospel was given to the Gentiles. It began at Christ's birth, three, or rather Christ's baptism, after his ministry officially as Messiah the Prince began at his baptism. Three and a half years later, he, after confirming the covenant with many, three and a half years later, he paid the price for sin entirely and put a permanent end to all sacrifices. From that point on, three and a half years, through his spirit-filled apostles, his apostles who were, who were filled with the spirit of Christ, continued to confirm to the Hebrews the salvation in his blood, the lamb shed from the foundation of the world. The one who brings in everlasting righteousness, makes reconciliation for iniquity, fulfilling everything that Daniel prophesied in chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. We have the infallible historical record of that perfect and complete fulfillment by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. I want to reiterate that the New Testament is the proof unimpeachable that Jesus and Jesus alone was the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. There is no 2,000 year gap. But the Jesuits, as crafty as they were, got the Protestant seminaries to begin preaching this cockamamie futurist ad, uh, interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, saying that Daniel's prophecy was not fulfilled. The 70th week of Daniel is detached from the end of the 69th week and cast all through, clear over the entire church age and doesn't come to rest until just before Jesus Christ returns. How fortunate for the papacy, right? Now, listen, whatever the Jesuits do, we must understand that it's going to benefit the papacy, right? And it's going to destroy the Protestants, right? The Protestants are the one who say Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the Antichrist. And, of course... If the papacy is going to continue to con rule over the kings of the earth and bind men's consciences to man's law and nullify God's law as it's done from its very beginning, then people have to be taught that the pope is not the Antichrist, that instead he's the head of the Christian religion. 
He is the sole authority in the Christian religion, and that's what futurism accomplishes. That is what has been accomplished. And futurism has been taught from every Protestant and evangelical pulpit in the world. In some form or not, futurism is the teaching. Historicism is never once uttered in the churches. I want you to wrap your brain around the fact that Christians today don't believe what Christians have believed ever since the first century. We are like ignoramuses in comparison. Walking the streets of Europe prior to the 1800s, you could ask anybody, who's the Antichrist? The Pope! Who is it that reigns over the kings of the earth? The Pope! Who is it that sheds the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus? The Pope! Who is the counterfeit Christ? The Pope! Who is the massacre, the torturer, the persecutor of the saints of Almighty God? The Pope! And who serves the Pope in this world? The kings of the earth. The governments of the all Europe. There was no ignorance. They heeded Paul's warning. They knew exactly who Paul was talking about, just like the Thessalonians did. Now, why are we so ignorant today? Well, because the Jesuits were serious about their war against Protestantism. The Jesuits were dead serious about their war of annihilation against Protestantism. They were dead serious in their mandate, their threat, their intent to completely take over the world and to eliminate any and all opposition. That the Pope is, as it were, God on earth, and every king of the world, if he be a government du jour, must serve the man in Rome. or die by execution, by regime change, by economic sanction, by political sanction, by whatever the Pope can devise to either correct that king of the earth and convert him to Roman Catholicism and to defend Roman Catholic canon law and the Pope's right and to rule and reign over the kings of the earth, or to be destroyed. Now, whenever you hear terms from the American government like regime change, like government overthrow, like political coup, uh, like economic sanction, you're, you're seeing the, the effects of papal control. This is how it was during the dark and middle ages, but nobody puts the blame on the Pope anymore because they believe the 70th week of Daniel is future and that the man of sin, the son of perdition, won't be revealed to the world until a long time in the future. So all this talk about the Pope being the Antichrist, well, they had to be wrong. You see how they've overturned the truth and made mental invalids of all of us? Now look, I don't want to be accused of looking down my long nose at every brother in Christ that I'm speaking to. I held these beliefs for 50 years of my life. I am not one whit better than you. The only difference between me and historicist and my, the listeners as futurists is... I now understand the truth. The grace of God, my, Tom. That's right. The grace of Almighty God. The grace and mercy of Almighty God. And it's time for you to enjoy that same grace and mercy. And I'm sharing it with you.
I don't have a license to it. I don't have a copyright to it. I don't want a license or a copyright to the truth. The truth belongs to God, and he gives it to the saints of Almighty God. Well, haven't we suffered enough by the, the bloody hands of Rome? Haven't we suffered enough? It's time for us to know the truth. It's time for us to be liberated from papal governments. It's time for us not to have to wake up early in the morning, go to work, and work all day long to pay the taxes to support this anti-Christ government, to support these anti-Christ pastors behind the pulpits of our churches, to support these anti-Christ Christian theological seminaries that fill us full of futurist lies. It's time that we be free. Christ that gave us freedom. Freedom from the guilt of sin. So why do we allow priesters and pastors to bind our consciences to sin and to worship and support an anti-Christ system? The governments of this world according to the scriptures, were intended to be an instrument of God to reward good and to punish evil. Instead, as we know by our own experience, they, they reward evil and punish good. Why is the earth drenched with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus? Because the kings of the earth do not serve Christ. They serve the Antichrist in Rome. And the saints of Almighty God are, are, are killed all the day long by the governments that serve the papacy. The governments of the world are put in place now to serve the man of sin, not the son of man. Get it out of your head, this idea that the United States is the greatest Christian nation that ever was. That is a lie, flat out lie. This nation started out Protestant. It's now Roman Catholic. It's been in the transition to Roman Catholicism ever since before the Council of Trent. Slowly but surely, the Jesuits infiltrated this country. Slowly but surely, bit by bit, they got control of the federal government in Washington, D.C. They now have the control of the, of the state governments. It is them that make the rules and the regulations and the laws of this country. They are the ones that are tearing down our Protestant liberties and our Protestant Constitution and making us all subjects of the Roman Pontiff. And they've got control of our churches too. And how do you know they've got control of our churches? Because they preach, pro they preach anti-Protestant futurism. They preach anti-Christ futurism. They teach pro-papal futurism. It's a papal church. If it preaches futurism, it's a papal church. It may call itself Baptist. It may call itself Lutheran. It may call itself Protestant or ba Baptist or Presbyterian or Seventh-day Adventist, but if they preach futurism, they are a papal church. Okay? It's just like a woman who marries a man today but keeps her maiden name. They are all married to a different spouse now. They've divorced Christ. They've married the Antichrist in Rome, but they don't want anybody to know it, so they keep their own maiden name. Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, you name it. But they are all the wives and daughters of the, of the man of sin in Rome. If they preach futurism, they are dead in the wool, a Roman Catholic church. 
and they're going to lead you down the primrose path to perdition. That is their purpose. Remember, the Jesuits swore at the Council of Trent to destroy Protestantism lock, stock, and barrel, that there be no more protest in the world against the papacy. And your church is the instrument of their warfare. Your pastor is the instrument of their warfare against your truth-tellers. Okay? It's your pastor, the one that you love and trust the most, that are teaching you futurist lies, Jesuit lies, Roman Catholic lies, papal lies. That's what futurism is. Because it destroys your understanding, the one, the understanding that we've always had up until 1805 or so, that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. There's a very good reason why the, the priests of the Roman Catholic Church are pedophiles. God is simply exposing in this ecumenical age who it is that we're getting in bed with spiritually in the churches with this futurist doctrine, this futurist teaching. Pedophiles! Do you think that's God's will? Who would have any part of a church that harbors pedophile priests? And let me tell you something else. And this, you're gonna, you may not like what I've got to say now. But I can't apologize for the truth. This is the hardest thing to teach you. That these futurist pastors that want us so much to forgive those who martyred the saints of Almighty God, the popes of history and the kings of the earth that served him, so much so that they would deny that the man of sin, the son of perdition in Rome, is not only not the Antichrist, the little horn, the beast, the, the, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy, but he's the head of the Christian world, and we ought to all unite and obey him and conform our mode of worship according to that of the Roman Catholic Church and begin making sacrifice again. Instead of... Uh, of the communion table where we remember what Christ did for us 2,000 years ago, we now are going to be commanded to stand at the altar every day making the self-same sacrifice every day, all day long. That the communion bread and the wine is not just a memorial, it's a virtual salvific efficacious sacrifice just like the one at Calvary 2,000 years ago. That's where this is going. And you've heard me until it's become cliche. Those who make sacrifice after the perfect sacrifice the Lamb of God was slain 2,000 years ago on temple uh, outside the city walls in Jerusalem on Golgotha's Hill must be performed every day, all over the world, in every church, the self-same sacrifice that Jesus made once and for all, according to the Scriptures, must be repeated over and over and over and over again, thus conforming every Protestant evangelical church to the very image of the beast in Rome is proof positive that the Bible is God's Word. It told the truth from the beginning. We now understand unequivocally the Bible is the greatest authority in the, in the universe, and it's telling us the truth, and we ought to believe it, we ought to obey it, and we ought to condemn this sin wherever we find it. It's called futurism. It's papal. It's diabolical. It's Satan's masterwork. It is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, and it needs to be routed out of our churches and out of our country and out of the world in Jesus' name. Today. And we need to return to the truth. And then all of a sudden, 
history and the scriptures hold hands. That our enemy has been defeated because we all know his works. We know the wiles of Satan as they are performed in the world by the man of sin in Rome. That's how you have victory over Satan. You identify his works. You uncover the wiles of the devil that no man can be deceived by him any longer. That's my gift to you. That's Steve Wahlberg's gift to you. And it's free. No copyrights. God has the right to the truth. And he shares it freely with his saints. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I think since our broadcast has taken a little other direction than reading from the book, which is perfectly fine by me, I want to make another point. And I want you to elaborate on that point. Uh, I will make that point with two pictures. And before we go into the pictures, I want to say a little bit about them. In your explanation that you gave for the last 20 minutes or so, you said that the churches all have been taken over. Since 1805, 1810, futurism was taught in the churches, not only in England, but also in the United States. Things that never ever anybody had heard about. And you also said that the Jesuits had sworn at the Council of Trent to annihilate Protestantism and the true word of God to be taught in the churches in the, or around the world. Correct, right? That's correct. Now, I know from your earlier readings that you did years ago on Inquisition Update, while you were on First Amendment Radio, that you because I have an excerpt video of, I don't know, 15 minutes or something about that, like Freemasons in the churches, but I don't want to go into Billy Graham and all that stuff. That's too obvious. I want to go to the roots, because you say in this broadcast, all the churches have been infiltrated by the Jesuits. All the churches have been infiltrated by the Jesuitical seminaries, because anybody who wants to become a quote-unquote reverend, pastor, priest, whatever, has to go through the Jesuitical um, education system in the seminaries and this way it was the goal from the Jesuits from the beginning to take over the churches especially the churches of the United States of America do we agree so far on this yes look this picture is a picture that says more than a thousand words to those who know what this picture resembles And you spoke about this in the past, and I want you to elaborate a little bit more for our viewers today, because I guess there are many people who watch this video who have never ever heard what you are going about to say. I'm doing the intro, and you are going to elaborate a little bit more, because your knowledge on this is much deeper than mine. This is a photograph taken from a wide angle from the Capitol balcony that shows uh, the United States President Ronald Reagan visible at the center and that you can see here, uh, where my finger is, that's him, seen from the back, addressing the nation following his swearing-in ceremony, so when he was inaugurated into his office in Washington, and he is facing the obelisk that you can see there in the back. Now, I'm not going to give, uh, give away the hot point Tom will tell you about, Why is this a unique moment that happened? And what does this moment mean to the initiated? What is the picture speak of this? Why is he turning to the obelisk that never ever any president has done before, Tom? Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about this? Well, yes, indeed, I can tell them more about it. And first of all, Uh, this photograph is going to be virtually unrecognizable by a vast majority of the people simply because it is taken uh, uh, for, with a wide-angle lens and, and, the, and the portico on the back of the, uh, the Capitol building is distorted 
to the point where it's almost unrecognizable. But this is indeed uh, the from a photo taken from the roof of the Capitol building down to the steps of of, of the uh, the uh, uh, balcony there, and then looking out forward toward the very top of the photograph, you'll see just the very, you're looking right down the mall, what is called the mall in Washington, D.C., the reflecting pool, and and uh, the at the very end of that, right at the very top center of the photograph, you'll see the very bottom of the Washington Monument. There it is. There's a better look of it. All right. Do you comprehend what we're looking at here? It's a distorted image because taken with a fisheye lens, and apparently it's 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 dis, it's uh, distorting, uh, making everything look circular. But what we're looking at is the inauguration of a president of the United States, and if I, my memory serves me correctly, this was Ronald Reagan's inauguration uh, when he took the oath of office as to sw- to swore to serve the the the, uh, the Constitution of the United States. But it was sworn out of tradition on the opposite side of the Capitol, facing the obelisk. And uh, that obelisk was erected in this country. They call it the Washington Monument, but it's an obelisk, an Egyptian needle, which was used in ancient Egypt to worship the sun god. Okay, Ra. the the Egyptian sun god Ra, and Ronald Reagan, a clandestine Freemason, was swearing his uh, 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 his oath of the office of presidency facing that obelisk. And uh, what else that obelisk represents is the modern-day pharaoh. The modern-day Egyptian pharaoh is the current papacy. Okay? King of kings and lord of lords. Ronald Reagan, without telling anybody here, has moved... The ceremony, the swearing-in ceremony on the opposite side of the Capitol and facing an image that God hates. And it's an image that represents the authority of the modern-day Pharaoh in Rome, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And no matter whatever uh, Ronald Reagan said with his mouth, his oath according to Roman Catholic canon law, is null and void, and that his real oath of allegiance is to the man of sin in Rome. And what Ronald Reagan is doing is demonstrating his loyalty and commitment to the man of sin in Rome by facing that Egyptian obelisk as he swears in. So whatever he said with his mouth, in front of that obelisk is null and void on its face. That is the beloved Ronald Reagan that I so much loved and appreciated and voted for twice. And if I live to be a thousand years, I'll never live it down. This Ronald Reagan <clears throat> was not only a Freemason, he was an honorary knight of Malta. He was also a, an Irish Roman Catholic He even made a presidential trip to Ireland to see his old stomping ground. He is an Irish Roman Catholic. He served the Pope his entire administration. And you've got a picture also in your pictorial arsenal there showing Ronald Reagan, the Papal Knight of Malta, the 33rd degree honorary Freemason, sitting there one-on-one with the Pope of Rome, committing this country to the authority of the papacy. Yeah, that picture is coming later, Tom. Sorry to interrupt That's... you here, but there's another point that I wanted to make with this picture. And yeah. that is the hidden message that is in there. What is for the initiated the message that is spread around the world to every Jesuit in the know when for the very first time an American president takes his oath facing the obelisk? What well, was it, the it, arrangement? It, 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 it's inherent 
what what he's saying is inherent in everything that I've said so far. Protestantism is dead. It was it, a they, silent sign that only the initiated knew about that all the churches of the United States of America have been successfully infiltrated by the Jesuits. And how do we know that's true? How do we know what Ronald Reagan is literally saying by having this ceremony the way he designed it? How, what is he saying? He's saying the Protestant churches have now been conquered. And how were they conquered? By futurism. Exactly. Futurism. All the churches now preach futurism. They have, with their own mouths, defied the very tenets of Protestantism, which is, class, Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. But they're all futurists now. They all believe the Antichrist doesn't come until just before Christ returns. What have they done? They've exonerated the whole history of the man of sin throughout Christendom and all of its history for the last 15, 17, whenever you want to mark the beginning of the papacy, all of that time, they've been forgiven for all their sins. There's no Protestant to protest the Antichrist anymore because they all believe in a future Antichrist. Ronald Reagan, right here in this image, is telling the Jesuits of the Council of Trent He's telling the popes of history that Protestantism is done. Stick a fork in it. It's a dead smoking hole in the ground. There is no more Protestantism in this country. And this government under Ronald Reagan will never again kowtow to Protestant and evangelical leaders. They are the imbeciles of Christianity they have defied their own faces. They have shamed themselves in believing in futurism. They have exposed to the whole world that they were never serious about their Protestant Reformation. And they're a laughing stock at the world. They're going to go back to the Roman Catholic Church, hook, line, and sinker, whether they like it or not, because this government is going to make them Catholic by the civil laws of this land. Roman Catholic canon law is now the agenda of the White House, the agenda of Congress, the, the agenda of the Supreme Court, and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights written by Protestants is going out the window, and this is going to become a papal enclave, just as if it was smack right dab in the center of, of, of uh, St. Peter's in Rome. And that's exactly what's happened. Protestants look, capitulated to the papal authority. That's, that's right. And they've been put down and absolutely shamed to their face by this act of Ronald Reagan. Ronald well, Reagan, with a smile on his face, has just slapped the Protestants into oblivion. And they was, got what they had coming. Oh, was, that, that's not going to be received very well, but they got what they had coming. They denied the truth that they had upheld for 1,500 years. They had denied the very tenets of Protestantism by believing in futurism. They've proved themselves to the whole world and even themselves that Protestantism isn't worth the air it takes to say it. It's a phony, empty suit. It's destroyed, and it destroyed itself, and nobody can even blame Rome for doing it. How do you like that? Pretty difficult, isn't it? You, by now, you're probably hating me, okay? But it's the truth. Now, are we going to let these sons of hell get by with this? I think, just as it was in the city of Nineveh, 
they all got down on their faces in sackcloth and ashes. From the king all the way down to the street sweeper. They sinned. And they confessed their sin. And God prolonged their days. Let me tell you, if the Protestant world does not acknowledge their sin of futurism and get down on their face in sackcloth and ashes, confessing their sins and, and, and converting back to Protestantism, then our days will not be prolonged. And you can thank your Jesuit-trained Protestant seminarians for bringing this hell upon us. You're going to watch, as time continues, the complete destruction of our Protestant civil rights. You're going to watch the continued destruction of the authorized King James Version of the Bible. And anybody who quotes from that book is going to be called a hater. Why? Because you can't read the authorized King James Version of the Bible and not come to the eventual realization that the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the beast, the Antichrist is literally, was literally, always will be literally the papacy. And the problem with Rome is Roman Catholics came to that realization at the time of the Protestant Reformation. That's why Roman Catholics left the, Pro the Roman Catholic Church in droves, defied their papal governments in every country they lived in, and said this country is going to belong to Christ and no longer the Antichrist. And we are going to elect our own kings and not the Pope of Rome any longer going to elect our, pro, our, our pastor, or rather our kings and our potentates. you got to ask yourself the question now, who really uh, seats the President of the United States? How long has it been since we had a true Protestant, a Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing Protestant in the White House? Probably since Abraham Lincoln. That would be my guess. But listen, Tom, we have two more agendas that uh, President Ronald Reagan was following. Um, the second one is something that you already brought up, and I want to show the picture here for. And I think you can elaborate a little bit about that, right? I don't know where this picture was actually taken, but I know there was a similar meeting as this one. Here you see uh, Antichrist Pope John Paul II and Roman Irish Roman Catholic Knight of Malta, 33rd degree Freemason, sitting at the right hand of the Antichrist. And uh, you have to ask yourself, why is the President of the United States, without the witness of anybody but a photographer, speaking in private, in confidence, to the man of sin, the son of perdition. And what's he saying to him? Well, there was a similar meeting to this one in Anchorage, Alaska, back in the 80s. And Ronald Reagan was reported it being a similar situation with Pope John Paul II, as is depicted in this picture. And Ronald Reagan, after being browbeat by John Paul II for America being a materialistic nation, an immoral nation, a, a nation that aborts its children, and, uh, a, and a selfish nation, the richest, most uh, uh, anti-God nation on the planet, needs to, be, needs to come to Christ. <laughs> which means you need to come to the Antichrist Pope that's sitting on your left-hand side, right? Well, after taking a literal brow beating by the man of sin in Rome, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, according to Roman Catholic canon law and the Jesuits, this oath-spitting demon called Ronald Reagan got down on his knees in front of the Pope of Rome, seated there in front of him, 
and said, Holy Father, I give you my country. He fulfilled the oath he took to the Pope on the wrong side of the Capitol building and his swearing in facing the obelisk, promising to worship and serve the Roman Pharaoh. And that's the culmination of his service on his knees before the man of sin in Rome and handing over without our permission this entire nation. Protestantism is dead. Ronald Reagan had nothing to fear. Are we going to let him get by with this? I tell you, I think Protestantism is dead. I don't think Protestants are going to return to their Protestant beliefs because it's going to be just too costly. We'll have to mingle our blood with the saints that have gone before us, and I don't think there's the courage anymore. I don't think there's the spiritual fortitude anymore. I don't think there's a commitment to the truth anymore. I think, like Paul, John Paul too said, we're too materialistic, we're too into ourselves to serve Christ, but we'd rather serve Antichrist. Well, I'll tell you one thing. This might be a Roman Catholic nation now, but it wasn't at its founding. We've failed. Our failure is no less than that of Israel who fell before us. We had it all. We had a nation rich in natural resources, rich in righteousness, rich in the knowledge of Christ, and we threw it all away because we bought the lie called futurism. We've invested everything we could spiritually muster in this phony futurist baloney, and now we're paying the piper. And it's only going to get worse unless we repent like they did in Nineveh when Jonah brought them the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, Tom, I'm sorry I can't let you go just now. (laughs) Even though I know you're quite exhausted about what I ask of you today. But there was a third agenda of Mr. Ronald Reagan. And that third agenda, let's just put a picture here with him and his wife visiting the Antichrist, um, that agenda was that he, Ronald Reagan, reinstituted formal diplomatic relations with the Antichrist, with the Vatican. Sure. These diplomatic relations had been abolished in 1867 as the American government at that time, through the Hunter Commission, got the knowledge of the involvement of the Vatican in the assassination of the President Abraham Lincoln. Mm-hmm. The whole story of the quote-unquote civil war, which was not civil because there's nothing, nothing civil about war anyway, Uh, But that war that tormented your country in the mid-19th century, um, that was just a try to split the country in two, into north and south, like they did with Vietnam and Korea and other countries, or with Germany into east and west. They wanted to split America from north to south in the quote-unquote civil war because uh, it is the Latin derivative um, divide et empera, divide and conquer. A fallen, a split nation, uh, uh, Jesus said that already, in a, uh, a house divided in itself cannot stand. When you divide the United States of America in the very early times, in the mid-19th century, into two parts, north and south, they are easier to conquer. 
That's why they fomented the civil war that was led and Jesuitically supported from the south and the north was more, I'd like to say, on the biblical side with President Lincoln uh, working out of Washington at the time. I don't want to go into the details. The point is the Jesuits fomented an assassination on President Lincoln. The American government got to know of it and they stopped diplomatic relationships with the Vatican at that time. Ronald Reagan then, first and for all, took his inauguration of, as we saw in the one picture, facing the obelisk, giving the secret message to everybody in the knowledge that Protestantism in America has ceased to exist. Then he went on his knees before Antichrist, Pope John Paul II, to donate something that is not his to the Antichrist, namely his country, because it's not of the president, it's not the president's possession. He is not in the position to donate this or to give this to anyone. Surely not to the Antichrist. Surely not without the consent of the people living there. And third of all, then he restored the diplomatic relationships full scale with the Antichrist, with the Vatican. I don't know the exact year, you can look that up, but he was the first to send an official diplomatic ambassador back to the Vatican. There were personal representatives of the American president in the Vatican present all since the time since, uh, I think, Woodrow Wilson, the beginning of the 20th century. Woodrow Wilson, the president who sold out your country to the Federal Reserve, the Vatican-led bank. But that's another point. But Ronald Reagan did three absolutely devilish things. He secretly gave the sign to the leading quote-unquote church people in the world that Protestantism had ceased to exist in America. He donated his country, which is not his, to the Antichrist. And he reinstalled complete diplomatic relations with the Vatican. Sorry, with the Vatican. And Tom, I think that that would be your last comment. Maybe putting all these three together, giving us a little bit more background knowledge on this, and with that ending the broadcast today and putting that in an uh, uh, understandable way uh, for our listeners and viewers of the video to have a look at. Certainly, this is not taught in the churches today, but it should be that Abraham Lincoln conceived and understood, he and his cabinet, that the principal dividing factor in the United States during the Civil War was the Vatican's influence. The Vatican was the one who tried to divide and conquer this nation. It was a Protestant nation, and it needed to be converted to a Catholic nation. And it was the Vatican who sub sub supported publicly uh, the president of the South, Jefferson Davis. So when the war was over and the victory was in the North, uh, President Lincoln cut all diplomatic ties with the Vatican. He understood the Protestant tenet that no foreign power should have any say in American politics and American policy that that ought to be determined by the people, of, by, and for the people, okay? Now, the people were vastly Protestant in this country. So, so Abraham Lincoln understood that there was not only a political coup headed up by the Pope, but a religious coup headed up by the Pope. And history recorded that it was an organization headed up by the Jesuits that was responsible for Abraham Lincoln's assassination. But the point we want to make is that Lincoln cut all ties with the Vatican and made it virtually illegal to consult the papacy for anything. Okay, It was unconstitutional for a foreign unelected potentate to govern or have influence in this country. It's a, it's a tenet that every American should understand to this day. The Pope of Rome is a king of a global state.
called Roman Catholicism. And he has publicly stated in writing over and over in papal encyclicals and papal bulls that he holds upon this earth the place of God Almighty and King of kings and Lord of lords, that he is the judge of every man and no man may judge him. What does that make him but God on the earth? Now, it, if, if that is understood, that that is the position of the papacy, every king on this earth is put on notice. Whether it's in writing, it's certainly implied in papal writing that the Pope's not going to take any back sass from any government in this world. And when Ronald Reagan uh, 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 made it virtually illegal for any more papal influence in this country, he declared an all-out war against the papacy, which the papacy was gladly glad to oblige. And there's been a wrestling, a war for the, for the control of this country between the elected officials and the papacy ever since. And the papacy has won because Ronald Reagan, as you rightly said, in, all, in addition to all the other things that we've talked about that he did to defy the rightful authority of the people and especially the Protestant people of this country, the last great insult that he did against Protestantism was to reestablish diplomatic relations, formal diplomatic relations with the Vatican. Now, I must concede that pre presidents long prior to, to, to uh, uh, Ronald Reagan were consulting the papacy privately. That's what I'm saying. They had private, uh, 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 not ambassadors, but uh, secretaries and, and, and uh, spokesmen well, personal sent over. Messengers. Yeah, personal, personal messengers, messengers sent over to the Vatican. Even, even, even all through the uh, uh, Second World War and the That's First right. World War, because right. the Vatican then was the, the beehive of diplomacy of the world. That's right. And That's you went right. into that in your reading of uh, the Global Vatican by Francis Rooney, how, right. how the Vatican is the absolute epitome of uh, secret societies, not only, but also of all intelligence Foreign agencies on right. the world. Everybody, is. they are all meeting there, you know, right. their, their people are out on the battlefield fighting wars. And these guys sitting there in the evening drinking wine together in the Vatican. That's how the kings of the earth, together with the Pope, rule the world. And they rule every, every battleground. The, the messengers from the battlefields all over the world, from every government, take their, their uh, 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 intelligence uh, attaches and send them to the Vatican privately, publicly, or whatever means. And they get together with the Pope and they decide ahead of time the outcome of every conflict. And uh, the presidency of the United States has known this. That's why the pres presidency of the United States has always sent private messengers, unconstitutional, but private men messengers to the papacy to consult with the papacy, to share intelligence. I think they Edward, done, Edward Mendelhouse was the first one uh, sent from Woodrow Wilson, wasn't he? Yes. Oh, he, he was. was a, he was a confidant of uh, of Wilson and initiated this sending of personal messengers back to the Vatican during the uh, World War One, I, I think. And that was Edward Mendelhaus, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. And uh, and of course, the Vatican has been intimately aware of everything that takes place in this country, and uh, for uh, for all all throughout the history of the country. You know, people just have never been taught this, especially by their priests and pastors. Why? Because they're in on the deal. They surrendered to Rome long ago. Absolutely. They surrendered to Rome a long time ago. They sheepishly admitted that we were wrong about the Protestant Reformation. The man of sin is future, not present, not history, not present or history. It's not the papacy. It's somebody that looks like Mitt Romney that's going to show up about seven years before Christ returns. That's the cockamamie baloney that's believed in all the churches today. And, and they, they sold your spiritual life right down the river. 
when they acknowledged this futurist lie and began to teach it in the churches. That's why you don't know who the Antichrist is. That's why you don't know what the wars of the world represent and who's running them and for whose benefit. That's why you gladly go traipsing off to war and shooting the enemy and delivering Rome's goods all over the world, Rome's inquisition all over the world. You know, the United States is the greatest Roman inquisitor ever in the history of the world. There's a reason why the United States, an independent democratic nation, has become the global police force. Just ask Ronald Reagan. Just ask Ronald Reagan. Just ask Woodrow Wilson. Just ask Abraham Lincoln. They all knew the truth. Just ask John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy actually went to war against papal control of our government. And that's why he was killed in broad daylight at high noon with cameras rolling and nobody went to jail. Ritually sacrificed he was. That's how much power the Vatican has. I know you don't want to believe it. You've been taught the Antichrist is future. But you've been lied to. And you need to repent. You're never going to make sense out of what's going on in this country or the world unless you return to your Protestant historicist understanding. And what is that? Class, once again, Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. And for you dyed-in-the-wool futurists who are desperately hanging on to a dying corpse called futurism, do you have anything at all that rivals what you've been hearing on this broadcast for the last six months? You can't hold a candle to this. Your futurism is a laughing stock for anybody who knows anything about the Bible and about history. You're nothing but a bunch of bumbling fools. And Christ is going to whip you like a dog until you convert to historicist Protestantism. The Spirit of God is never going to leave you alone. You cannot continue to deceive God's people and be comfortable in your spirit nor in your skin. You shall not rest day nor night until you do like they did in Nineveh. Confess your sins in sackcloth and ashes. And if you wish to remain behind the pulpit in this Protestant nation, you better dang well be a Protestant. Protestantism is the truth. Historicism is the truth. And the truth has more witnesses, more sacrificial witnesses than all the liars of history. And their blood, like righteous Abel's, still crieth to God from the ground upon which it was spilt all throughout the Christian era by the man of sin, the son of perdition in Rome. Our righteous King of kings and Lord of lords doth come soon. Your days are numbered. What will he find you doing when he returns? I know what he'll find me doing repenting of my sins in sackcloth and ashes on my face before God and man. I believed in this lie called futurism for 50 years of my life, and I repent publicly with shame face. And now I'm free to tell the truth.
What will you do with the truth? Thanks, Jerk. Thank you, Tom. See you all next week. The President DeJoya's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, but both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr. Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this house. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist. A reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. Well, let me say this. If the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ and his truth. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.